Tena koutou katoa. Kei te whare wānanga o Otako ahau i Mahiana, he kai kōrero pūtaiau ahau, ko kathi kou toku ingoa, nō reira, tēnā koutou katoa. Good afternoon to all of you joining us here today for our lightning talk session as part of the SCANS 2021 conference. My name's Kathy Cole and I'm a lecturer in the University of Otago's Department of Science Communication. And it's my very great pleasure today to host our lightning talks on behalf of SCANS, which for any of you who are new to us is the Science Communicators Association of New Zealand. We are a network of people who tell stories about scientific topics, and we hold regular events for people who are keen to hone their storytelling skills and connect with other professionals. And today we have eight speakers across seven lightning talks. So I'm going to introduce them individually um, as we go through the session rather than at the beginning as we have done in previous days. Um, but as, as with previous sessions, we'll save questions for the end. Um, there's just two exceptions to that. We've got two speakers who may not be able to stay for the full hour, so I'm, I'll invite one or two burning questions for those um, individual speakers just immediately after their talk. Um, otherwise, please write your questions in the chat as we go through, and we hope to answer all of them after each speaker has made their correro. So um, I, we're going to begin today with Keridwin Roberts. Keridwin grew up surrounded by people who loved science. Um, her own passion was for communication um, as a writer, actor, director, journalist, and from 1994 as a communications professional. The two parts of her life finally wove together in 2015 when she found science communication. Her portfolio of skills includes science interpretation for policy and the general public, media, website and social media management, stakeholder engagement, publication and newsletter production, branding and publicity. She's worked on a variety of eclectic topics, including climate science, fisheries, robotics, geology and engineering, economic policy, energy, tertiary education, the performing arts, social services and vehicle manufacturing. I think there's nothing that this woman cannot do. So science communication brings her personal experience and all of her skills into a role where she can work towards the public good and in alignment with her values. So thank you very much, Kerry Dwin. I'm going to speak to Uri Kainga. Here at the hour, I'm a Nagitoa for Kerry Dwin Roberts Aho. Here, Tato Etone, Kanui Takin Nihi. Um, I didn't realize that when I left the comfort of full time employment, that one of my key talents was what my bosses had been telling me off for. Um, and I can demonstrate this by talking about when I was working at Toyota, we spent an entire day um, on Myers Briggs personality types training, um, which I think many scientists will now be rolling their eyes at. Um, but it is still one of the very few training exercises I remember. Um, and that's because at the end of the day, we got given a, a humorous prayer that was supposed to encapsulate us. And mine was, Lord, please help me keep my mind on one thing at a, ooh, look at the birdie. And I think that pretty much sums me up. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about today is what's on the screen. Um, I've been writing plain English summaries of academic papers for seven years, but this year, I began condensing this information even further into plain English abstracts for a variety of national science challenges. Um, now, academic abstracts are often more interested in methodology and recommending avenues of further research than, are on, than they are on results and how they can be applied. So my first step is always to try and understand the original abstract which typically involves Googling terminology and any scientific ideas I haven't come across before. So, as an example, um, sometimes this result is relatively simple. So I explain the jargon and after checking the introduction and discussion and conclusion to make sure that there isn't anything I've missed, I can rewrite the abstract relatively quickly. Um, I use the Hemingway web editor tool to hone in and focus and check on passive voice, readability and age level, um, and the usual rules of plain English apply. Short sentences, white space, use of clear examples. So that's, that's the easy ones. But what is glowing beneath the surface? 
I've learned to trust that if I don't understand something, it doesn't mean I'm sick. That's, it hasn't been explained well. And that's been the hardest lesson that I've had to learn. I am not stupid. I just need to look harder. Um, and I try and break it down into its component elements. So useful questions for that include, is this a list? How many clauses does this sentence has? have um, how many you know, academic, uh, how many academic things that they don't need to put in there because they are trying to make sure that people don't actually um, believe everything they're actually saying because they're just pulling things off by not thinking of the right word. Um, uh, but that's not always enough. Because I'm focused on the public good, I always want there to be a way to apply the research. And this is often something that researchers forget or they bury in a single sentence in the results or the discussion section. Um, and if I can't find a few key messages in the abstract, it's time to dig a bit deeper. So a journal article is like clockwork. One cog makes another move, makes another go round. But some cogs are just spinning wheels. I tend to skip the literature review, methodology section, and any page with more than three equations. Um, I speed read the introduction and spend more time on the discussions results section and the conclusions. In particular, I note sentences that feel like recommendations. Useful questions that I ask myself while reading these things include, what would happen if people paid attention to this paper and understood it? Who is the audience for this paper? And whose lives would change as the result of this paper? So finally, sometimes the only way to keep going is to trick your brain with bribery and corruption. For me, the satisfaction of completing 10 perfect plain English abstracts tastes like chocolate. Thank you very much, Kerry Duran. That was fantastic. Our, our next speaker is Chris Duggan. Chris is the founder and CEO of the House of Science, a charitable trust that empowers primary and intermediate school teachers to deliver great hands-on science lessons. Established in Tauranga eight years ago, there are now close to 500 schools accessing a shared library of resource kits on a fortnightly basis. Chris has won numerous awards for her innovative support of primary science. Thank you very much, Chris. Kia ora, and thank you, Cathy, for that introduction. There we go. And um, yeah, kia ora koutou, it's lovely to be here. Um, I'm extremely proud of the House of Science and all that we've achieved to date. Although this is my baby, we all know that it takes a village and I need to acknowledge my board of directors, my staff, and a huge team of volunteers around the country that go above and beyond all the time to make this vision a reality. Many of you have followed and supported us in various ways over the past eight years. And I'm happy to report that we're now servicing close to 500 schools in 16 regions around the country with over 10,000 students a week accessing our resource kits. That's before lockdown. <laughs> our resources are currently curated to communicate current science and make it engaging and accessible for young children. <clears throat> we work closely with scientists from CRIs and CORES and other national organizations to develop hands-on experiments that align to the curriculum and showcase actual science happening in our labs across the country. Things like uh, greenhouse gas emissions in dairy cows to industrial composting parameters from envir uh, environmental DNA uh, as a biodiversity indicator to sustainable fisheries management, we do it all. And it's a story of two very different worlds, that of our primary schools and that of science colliding in a good way. Um, today, I'd like to showcase a school in Tauranga that has seen firsthand how these science kits have improved student engagement and improved student behavior and improved student achievement across a range of subjects. The Welcome Bay School have used the House of Science resource kits for six years. And like most of our member schools, not every teacher was on board with the kits, but those that were used them regularly and loved them. 
One of these teachers was Katrina, Katrina Daniels, who after completing the Royal Society Teacher Leadership Program, Science Teacher Leadership Program, in 2017, she saw an opportunity. She knew that the science kits were highly engaging for students and that the kits support teachers' um, knowledge and confidence to deliver good science lessons. She also knew that there was a cohort of students who were particularly disengaged from school at the time. They were the year five boys, surprise, surprise. And their behavior was problematic, um, their attendance was unacceptable, and their writing grades were well below the national average. So Katrina bravely proposed a radical shift in the teaching approach across the whole school, delivering all so the subjects through a science lens. And in 2018, the school chose a broad science content strand and one science capability or skill to focus their learning on for the whole year. So the House of Science kits provided the teacher with the necessary resources and a team approach meant that all, all the teachers were supported in this initiative. It was a multifaceted intervention, but as this is a SCANS conference, I'll focus on the communication that underpinned this initiative. So firstly, there was the development of a shared language. All the learning spaces from the classrooms to the staff room right through the, to the principal's office had visual displays depicting the science capability and how it was used across the curriculum. Students began to see themselves as scientists when they were studying history, playing sport or writing stories. And secondly, there was a clear evidence of consistent messaging. Katrina said that teaching through science is the way we do things at our place. Tamariki know they are scientists and articulate that to their peers, to their whānau, to their kaiako, and to the wider community. And here's the exciting bit. In just six months, the school saw a positive and sustained improvement in knowledge and skills across a range of subjects. Now, all students in year four to six sit a science thinking test twice a year at Welcome Bay School. They're also assessed on their writing, reading, and math stability. And you can see from the graph on the right that the year five students who were particularly targeted in this approach, in term two of 2018, they were well below the national norms in science and this thinking test that they did. However, in term four, just six months later, that same cohort was exceeding the national norms. The following year, they continued to improve. And the students in the younger cohort and the graph on the left also improved significantly compared to national norms. So not only that, the school reported that this data correlated with similar progress in the students' writing and their behavior improved significantly. And it basically proved that for these students, science unlocked their love for learning. Today, the school continues to deliver the whole curriculum through the context of science and Katrina has shared their journey with other schools across the Motu. So thank you for the opportunity to share this um, with you all. And if you would like to find out more, we're actually holding a Zoom around the room, a bit of a virtual open home via Zoom in a couple of weeks time. And I'll put these details in the chat as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chris. It's a wonderful talk and great to see the, the results that you've measured from, from that work. Um, just before we move on, I meant to ask if anybody had a quick question for Keridwin from her talk around um, writing science abstracts. I'm afraid she will need to leave in about 10 minutes. So if anybody had a burning question, um, feel free to jump in now. I'm just going to quickly ask one, which was, um, you said, Kerridu, in the, in the last seven years, um, you've been writing these abstracts. And I wondered if you'd actually seen a, a change in how scientists write abstracts over that time, because I think people are a bit more aware of trying to write with impact and showing the implications of their work. And have you seen those changes or is that a dream? <laughs> <laughs> I think it, I think it is changing. Um, uh, particularly some journals are now actually asking for plain English abstracts and that that as well as the academic ones and it's very interesting to look at why they're doing that and what what um, and what they look like um, although I have to admit some of the ones that I was looking some of the papers that I was looking at this year also included 
plain English abstracts, which were not very plain. Uh, <laughs> but it was definitely a step in the right direction. And I'm feeling really quite excited that journals are actually keen to do that. Um, yeah, which is good. Um, lots of the climate si side of things doing that and um, disaster resilience as well. That's great to know. Thank you. Um, hopefully you'll have seen in the chat, there's lots of um, appreciative comments. So thank you, Keridwin. That's wonderful. So we'll, we'll move on. Um, our next speaker is Anna Pendergrast. Anna is the co-lead of Anti-Static, a communications and research consultancy that focuses on issues around digital technology and the environment. Um, the other half of Antistatic is Anna's sister, Kelly Pendergrast, who lives in San Francisco. Anna is a writer, strategist and policy analyst. She helps people communicate about the complex issues that they're working on in order to drive positive social and environmental change. Much of Anna's recent work has focused on the digital technology and data systems and their impacts on individuals, communities and the environment. Before founding Antistatic, Anna was a policy analyst and a senior strategy advisor in the public service. And she has a Bachelor of Arts in Film and Media Studies from the University of Otago. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you very much, Kathy. Kia ora koutou, kwa Anna Pendergrast, aho. Um, today I'm here to talk to you about uh, some, a slideshow of all things, a uh, collaborative slide deck that Kelly, the other half of Antistatic and I, keep together as a way of um, collaborating and getting our ideas together. When we first started um, Antistatic four years ago, we knew that in addition to client work, we were really keen to make sure uh, that we had a way of keeping our own ideas and our own practice of um, developing thoughts of, across the topics we were really interested in, which were broader, but also converged with the topics we work with, uh, with our clients. Um, and like many people, especially, you know, five years ago, we started with a blog. Um, we kept our ideas every couple of weeks. We posted something on something we found interesting. Um, but over a little bit of time, we realized that both these are quite time consuming. They take time to edit and write uh, and don't have a huge impact all the time. They often get lost in the stream of uh, discussion um, online or you can't build on top of topics um, so easily. And so we try to think about what we really enjoyed about our kind of collaboration together. We often, you know, we use Twitter like many people, um, but again, things get lost in the stream. So around that same time, we were having a discussion and my husband who does childcare for kids after school um, told me about two eight-year-olds who had been using a, a shared Google slide deck to share pictures of cars with each other. So they just after school get together either in the same room or separately and post pictures in a slide deck. So I thought it was both weird, but really cool that these kids had visual conversations with each other um, just by using tools that were available, um, but using them for a different purpose. So I'm gonna share my screen now. Um, and essentially after we heard that idea from the kids, we thought maybe we'd try this out for ourselves. Um, and for the last two and a half years now, we've been making a weekly slide um, that we have used to kind of um, share our ideas. So right now I'm just trying to share my screen and having a moment. Um, so hopefully what you can see now is uh, the first slide that we made on our slide deck um, multiple years ago, which kind of set out these rules of engagement that we came up with and we've stuck with over time. So we wanted an open way to share our ideas uh, so other people could see it. We really think that it's just keeping our ideas to ourselves is not that helpful over time and maybe someone can pick on something and run with it. Um, and so we started a blank slate on the 10th of December, 2018, which we eventually filled using just the tools that are built in with Google Docs. So no different colors or styles or anything. We just went for the chaos that was allowed from, from those tools and we started having a conversation with each other. Um, so over here, I posted up about someone that coughed up a, a blood clot in the shape of his lung. Kelly ran with that and said, that's gross, but also it reminded her of the Pantone color of the year, that year, which was living coral. Uh, we talked about ethics for data and that kind of thing, which is really up our alley for work. Um, and just essentially made this chaotic page, which I'm going to flip through some of the ones we've done since then, has continued over time. So this was from July this year, um, and our 100th slide, which was a kind of a, a big win for us that we just kept this thing going. 
So we talked about, I talked about the repair shop, which was my favorite program at the time. Uh, we compared the differences of images between when the ocean was in fire in the Gulf of Mexico with a picture of a black hole, um, that kind of thing. So we've just carried on. This is this week's slide. Um, having a, a conversation with each other through this tool that everyone can access. Uh, so we share this publicly as well, and people can pick up ideas and run with them. Um, and it's been really exciting for us. So I guess the cool thing about this is that it can be used for lots of different purposes. So we've used it to take notes for different lectures for people. Uh, we've done sessions over Zoom where everyone can make their own slides. And we know that other people kind of use this with students and schools and things. So just this way of using tools that anyone has access to, to kind of have a discussion. Um, and as you'll see here, some weeks we kind of suck at it and put one person will do a wall of text or we'll forget or life will, you know, get in the way. But um, this slide deck is, yeah, you can visit it here at andystaticpartners.com slash slides, um, but definitely is a way that we've been able to have a conversation with each other. Uh, and we hope to continue to do that for many years. So thank you very much. Kira, thanks so much, Anna. That's a wonderful talk and I'm sure there'll be many questions about that. Um, we'll move on to our next speakers. We've got a double act uh, with Molly McGid and Chrissy Emini. Um, uh, they are co-leaders of the University of Canterbury Science Communication Society. So Chrissy is a physics PhD student with a background in astronomy, Antarctic science and nanotechnology. Alongside her studies, she's an avid science educator who's passionate about sharing her skills through lecturing, hands-on workshops and community outreach. And Molly is a recent graduate from the University of Canterbury with a master's degree in biology. She's also a science communicator who has written articles for Science and Society magazine, collaborated on science animated videos, and most recently worked as a host and producer for several science podcasts. Thank you very much, Chrissy and Molly. Thank you for that introduction. <laughs> Kia ora koutou. My name is Molly and I've been interested in science communication since I was five years old and wrote an anatomically correct story about ladybugs. And since then I've been involved in a number of science communication activities, most recently working on a number of science podcasts. Kiara, my name is Chrissy. Um, I've actually been teaching for the past 10 years alongside my studies at UC. Um, it all began for me with undergraduate labs. That was my first taste of SciComm. Um, and as you heard, since then, I've been branching out into lecturing, community outreach, and I've been creating course content, especially for COVID. So um, more recently, though, I've started trying to dabble in my own online projects. And we met each other last year, actually, at the SCANS 2020 virtual conference. And we found that after all these amazing presentations, we were having hours long conversations about science communication. And we wondered why there wasn't a space on campus for this. And so we decided to make that space. We called it UC Science Communication Society or UCSC, where people could come together, create a community around science communication, learn SciComm skills and put them into practice. So our goal was to create a resource that both students and staff would wanna take advantage of. And I'm happy to tell you that currently we have members who've joined UCSC who are a mix of both staff, postgrad, and some undergrads. Um, we did some surveys early on and found that our members come from a range of diverse disciplines at UC, from maths to Antarctic studies. Um, and to better understand everybody and make sure our goals were aligned, we had a big brainstorm at the end of our first meeting together to determine what kind of SciComm our members actually had experience with, and then find out what are they interested in and what kind of tools would they like to learn. From this information, we created a monthly seminar series where we brought in speakers both from UC and from outside to share science communication skills and experiences to inspire everyone to engage with science communication. And following up on this, we decided to make an online platform. Uh, we chose to go with Facebook because we wanted to create a space that members could actually post their own SciComm content with us, advertise their kind of projects, but hear about the kind of events that we were hosting for them as well. Um, at the moment, this community has over 70 members. And we've learned a lot along the way. So first and foremost, get yourself a SciComm buddy um, because it's really hard to go it alone. I have greatly appreciated Molly's support in this journey. 
whether it's she's giving me confidence to send an email or a speak to face to face with someone who I really admire. Um, secondly, do not hesitate to ask. So we have had a year's worth of impressive researchers and science communicators present at our seminar series. Um, we have made a conscious effort to try to suppress our imposter syndrome and reach out and actively network. We also used the resources that our institution had for us. So this meant plugging rooms that our departments had, sending email blasts to the whole College of Science, and postering in public areas. You have no idea how a poster in an elevator can generate interest. And lastly, we learned to put our persistence that we've gotten for science research into practice. Sometimes it was a bumpy ride. We had engagement that was decreasing or we didn't have a speaker yet and we were scrambling to get one, but we sort of stuck with it, with the idea that we were creating a resource that was really important for our community. Hmm. I think I speak for both of us when I say we're really proud of what we've been able to create this year, but we totally acknowledge there is more to do. Um, Molly and I are the base of this group, but we would like to make it open to other people to join and grow this community and make it more sustainable in the future. We also want to acknowledge that we really appreciate that all the speakers who volunteered their time this year uh, did it out of their own free will <laughs> and their own free time. Um, but we would really like to be able to pay them for this time because we don't want to perpetuate that idea that psychom work is just for fun because we believe it's invaluable. And we're really proud that we've seen so much interest from our community and that we've created this from the ground up. But at the end of the day, we do need more support from our institutions. And this goes beyond UC. There is so much science communication resources out there, but oftentimes researchers are not aware of this, these resources and they're not encouraged to pursue science communication. So institutions need to be investing in these resources to make them more accessible. I think of how when postgrads come into lab research, they're given a lab manual and training. The same needs to be done for science communication to make sure that we're growing our skills across the board. And science communication at the end of the day is just as important for science research. Thank you for listening. Kiara, what an inspirational talk. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. Um, lots of appreciative comments again in the chat, um, and we'll have some questions later. Um, but we're going to move on to our next speaker, who's Kati Doring. Kati is a freshwater ecologist at the Cawthron Institute in Nelson. She's embarked on a journey to become a trained science communicator. So she's currently doing her PhD at the Centre for Science Communication at the University of Otago. And her research looks into how storytelling can be used as a tool to encourage rural communities, um, such as farmers, to record and share their knowledge on land management actions that improve water quality. So she will tell you some of her insights in her talk. Thanks, Kati. Kia ora, Kathy. Thank you. Um, and kia ora tata to everyone out there from wherever you may be. Um, let's delve right into it. Kathy gave the introduction. So without further ado, let the strength of our words strengthen our past, strengthen our land. And this whakatauki sets the scene quite nicely um, for what I'm going to talk about today, because it highlights how words or stories, in my case, can have the power to strengthen our land, um, and in my case, the land and, and fresh waters. So strengthening our fresh waters like rivers, lakes and wetlands can happen by restoring the land that surrounds them and not just at farm, small farm scales, but really at large scales, and in my case, catchment scales. And in case you're not familiar with what a catchment is, a catchment is the natural drainage area of rainwater where it gets collected and transported from the source, which is often the mountains, to the sea. So what are some of the land um, restoration actions that we're doing while well, we we plant trees along rivers and we install sediment traps to stop fine sediment draining into the rivers. We retire certain parts of farms and then we also fence streams. We're also really good at um, collecting water quality throughout New Zealand. So there's over 1,500 water quality monitoring sites where we head out and collect water quality um, monthly. And we also collect that data at 127 lakes at a monthly basis across New Zealand. Um, this is really just a snapshot for lakes because I believe there's 3,800 lakes throughout New Zealand. So 127 is just a small proportion. 
So my research over the last year in science communication has found that we're not really good at sharing what kind of actions have been done, where and to what extent within a catchment. And so what happens in my community stays in my community or in the rural communities. Um, and so we, we're not really good at sharing what we've learned and with other communities and other catchment care groups. And there's around 250 other river care groups around New Zealand. And so what that means is that we make, we tend to make the same mistakes because we can't learn from what others um, have experienced. We're also unaware of potential opportunities like funding, right? The other catchment group just got 10,000 trees given how did they get to that? We don't share, we don't know. And we also feel disconnected, not just within our own community, but with just the community across the ditch, so to speak, or across the hill, because often catchment communities aren't very far apart. So we really need to get the story, what we've done in terms of restoration out there. And so my research looked at what, who are the right people to take this message out there and how, how can we do that? So in terms of the who, I found that catchment champions are really the, the best people to do that. Um, champions are local people that are recognized in their community for their knowledge and experience. And you can see Trish here, and Trish is such a catchment champion from the um, Wanongoro catchment in Taranaki. And she won several awards and she was Dairy Woman of the Year back in 2019. And she really has the mana to share successful and the not so successful stories of restoration, which are often the ones we learn the most from, right? Tati, I yeah. just want to jump in and say that we actually can't see your screen. Are you... Really? Not at all? Like you haven't seen any of it? No, so I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. You would do uh -huh. a great job without it. <laughs> God, is that right? Can you see it now? No. Can you oh. unshare it and then do it again? Sorry, you should have interrupted straight away. Did I not share my screen? You should have said. So okay. you've guys just seen me and not my screen? This is ridiculous. <laughs> That's perfect. Oh, my now. You've done a shall great I go job. again or shall I just continue where I started? Or oh, where I ended up, like this lady. Can you see the, can you see her? Yeah, start oh. with Trish. That's great. <laughs> All right. Can you see just Trish? Awesome. All right. Well, this is Trish, who I've just talked to you about. And <laughs> Trish. Well, this is a different form of communication, right? Because we're not using any tools. Um, so Trish, yeah, she's one of those catchment champions, like I said. But it's not just single people that um that can be champions, they can also be groups. And so I went out and talked to a bunch of catchment care groups, five um, in forms of focus groups. So one in the North Island and four in the South Island. And um, I got these groups together, which are made up of farmers and lifestyle bloggers and other community members. And um, I gave them a bit of a template to, to guide what their stories could look like, but they were totally free to change that template. And um, they started to talk about a little bit who they are and what their vision is for their catchment and in terms of what actions, restoration actions they've done. And then um, another part of it was from us to you. So something where they really wanted to tell their, their story and what they thought other catchment groups should, should know. So catchment stories need to be told by the owner of the story. This is something that came up quite clearly where Iwi said Iwi are the ones that tell their story about their mātauranga and Pakeha um, tell their story. Um, catchment stories help foster relationship. They make feel people connected within their own community and, and across others. And stories can be captured in a visual format. They really like the idea of this template and um, stories don't always have to be oral. So if we were to share our stories or if catchment communities were to share their stories about the actions they've been doing on land, what we can learn from each other about the good things and the things that and went wrong. And then we can better understand the impacts our actions have on our fresh waters. So that will eventually lead to a healthy titayao, which is really everything we should, should strive for, for us and our children. So Nami Noi, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to shout out to um, the collaborators and the Center for Science Communication and um, the funders. And I'm so sorry that you didn't see half of my presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Kati. That was brilliant. I think you were doing such a great job of presenting your work that we didn't notice because it was so clearly explained. So um, I'm sorry that you didn't get the chance to show those early slides, but you, it was fantastic, inspiring talk. So thank you.
Um, we will move to our final speaker, Caitlin Martin. So Caitlin is a lecturer in science education, currently at the University of Waikato, but moving to the University of Canterbury in 2022. With a research and practice background in science communication and teaching, she helps to train new teachers to engage the next generation of students with science. Caitlin really loves human evolution, finding ways to help more people see themselves in science and that introductory biology lab where you put a drop of pond water under a microscope. So excited for your talk. Thanks, Caitlin. Awesome. Um, I just want to take a moment to uh, Tao and thank uh, Georgia and Kathy and everyone at SCANS and all the amazing speakers. It's such a great group. I can see there's 65 people on here, which is just uh, amazing. Welcome to uh, yeah this school's uh, uh, technology storage room where I'm presenting from today. <laughs> um, but yeah, so as uh, Kathy uh, mentioned, um, I am at, currently at the University of Waikato, but I will be moving down to the, to the University of Canterbury um, for the start of next year. Um, and really, uh, what I'm wanting to talk about today is sort of actually not so much research that I've personally done, but kind of where I see my research going. And I really liked uh, this style of talk, so thanks to SCAMS for kind of putting this on. Um, so if I'm being honest, uh, when I did my PhD down at, um, down here in Dunedin, uh, at the Center for Science Communication, I was very enticed by the idea of, uh, engagement and promoting engagement and making student engagement with science, um, better. That's what my thesis sort of centered on, uh, and I found it really interesting. I think one of the challenges is that throughout that whole process, um, I would get lots of questions and other opinions. And people sort of asking, oh, well, what about this factor or that factor? What happens when, you know, they leave school uh, and what's happening at home? And I was kind of like, well, hmm, I, I didn't focus on that in my study. So may, maybe in the future. Um, but I really wanted to start kind of moving beyond just looking at engagement to start thinking about how, um, yeah, sort of encompassing all of the different factors that are maybe around um, an individual that's going to impact how they engage with science not just looking at the engagement itself. Um, the, the model that I'm kind of using at the moment um, is sort of developed by uh, Louise Archer and her team sort of at King's College London and um, UCL. And this was based on um, a very uh, sort of a, a long-term study um, of looking at student aspirations in science as students sort of grew up and went through the school system. And um, the model that I'm looking at now is that if we think, um, here we kind of have a burning candle. And I kind of think of this as like the, the fire triangle of engagement. If we think of that burning candle is what, whatever it means to you for someone engaged with science. It could be a kid in their school class. It could be a young person wanting to work on a conservation project in their community. It could be a parent considering their options for vaccinations. Whatever that is, that burning candle is sort of a person using science in their life kind of tuned on to it. There's three different factors, just like in a fire triangle, three different important things. So you need the fuel, all right, for that fire to burn, which is sort of represented by this habitus and capital, which is going to be all the sort of experiences, attitudes, um, behaviors, people that they know, connections, all those things that someone brings with them. Um, and all the, the sort of knowledge that they're gonna bring with them and build up over time. Also important for the fire to burn is the oxygen, the environment around that candle, right? And that has to do with the environment in the community. What is sort of the current status of science? Um, what, how is science being used? Are they um, in a part of Facebook or social media that is feeding them misinformation and inaccurate science? That all has to do with the environment that's surrounding that person. And then, um, which I also love to look at as well, and we've talked about many today, are those experiences. They're sort of that spark, that, that source of heat uh, to light that candle as well. And when you can have all of those things, then you can sort of have that candle burning. What I'm interested in sort of looking at, especially I work in sort of uh, teacher education, um, is the science capital teaching approach. So this is a way that we can add. So this was developed um, by Louise Archer and her team in the UK. Um, but I would like to sort of adapt this into the New Zealand context and use it as a way, many of you will kind of know about um, changes to the New Zealand curriculum and sort of challenges that, you know, we will be facing and upskilling a lot of teachers um, in how to teach um, different knowledge and different sources of knowledge that they're maybe not aware of. And so how can they, how can we help train teachers to 
acknowledge that capital and all those experiences that students are bringing with them um, as a way to then engage their students um, better in the classroom. So these are some of the different kind of projects I'm working on. Um, I'm looking at sort of some environments and some of that oxygen around the candle, trying to understand how students make decisions using a bit of network theory. Um, and as always, um, you may have seen Amadeo and I were together. Um, that's because he's my partner. Um, and we love doing these kind of science experiences. And um, yeah, we know that those are incredibly important in sort of sparking that engagement. So yeah, trying to keep um, a wider view and yeah, acknowledge all these different parts. Awesome. So thanks guys. Um, I guess I'll hand it back to Kathy. I'm sure we will be doing some questions now, but yeah, thanks everyone for coming today. Great, thank you so much to all our speakers. And we do have a, quite a few questions that have come in. So I'll try and just um, go through some of those in the final 10 minutes or so. Um, one question that we have for Chris, um, actually two questions that are sort of around the same thing are, as around like, will you be using this, um, the House of Science um, platform for teaching vaccine related information? Yeah, good question. Of course, in this current environment, we have 38 different topics in our resource library of kits covering the whole science curriculum. So um, one of those kits is actually called Mighty Microbes and it looks at microorganisms. Um, but we were really careful when we developed that kit, we wanted to uh, fascinate kids and not scare them. It's all about fascination, not fear. Um, remember that all our kits are aimed at five to 12 year olds, primary and intermediate children. And so we looked at the beneficial microbes, especially those to do with um, around fermentation, lots of good uh, context that kids can relate to. And as far as the harmful microorganisms, we really focused on, um, on ways of uh, keeping the, themselves safe that was relevant for them. So we focused on, on aerosol transmission and hand washing and sneezing and um, good hygiene rather than vaccines, which is probably not that relevant for, for primary age kids. It wouldn't have been um, a, a conversation that they'll be having themselves. Their teachers, yes, but not the children themselves. So we've steered away from that actual conversation around vaccines and that kit. Thank you. That's fantastic. Um, a question for Anna. Um, Anna, can you use um, this with something like an iPad and stylus to add hand drawings to these kind of slides? Yeah, good question. I So we haven't tried it. Kelly and I have mainly just used the tools that we have available on the, the plain screen of Google Docs, so just boxes and shapes and things, but I think you can add anything um, that you can add into a Google slide deck. So I'd say yes, but we haven't tried it out. That's cool to know. Um, also, do you um, do you have a particular target audience in mind for this, or is it open to anybody to get involved with? Uh, so it's open to anyone to add comments or to read and to use ideas or just have a look. Um, the target audience is really Kelly and I. We do this primarily for ourselves, and I think by keeping it is something that we find interesting and want to do that's the only way we're going to keep it going. Sometimes it's uh, good to think that other people might look at it, so we do keep up our kind of pro process. But uh, yeah, keeping us as the primary audience, but absolutely open to anyone that wants to look. So we do share it in lots of different circumstances, um, and you're welcome to port it on. But yeah, um, hope that answers your question. Great, thank you. Um, a question for um, Molly and Chrissy was whether you have to be a student at UC to join the Facebook page, and whether there's a link. I think all of us are quite keen to see that. Um, no, you do not have to be a student. This is, we're hoping that the page can also be a place where people can share resources um, about SciComm that's going on or talks that are going on, you know, online or in person or anything that may be, may be happening in the SciComm space. So you're definitely more than welcome to join. We felt like we should plug UC because we were using their resources in their space um, and their online platforms. Um, but we have chosen not to become an official club at UC because of the management required with that long term until we feel like the foundation of this is a bit stronger. So to be honest, we're really just a little grassroots society that's just gone around the UK. <laughs> so you're all welcome. <laughs> Should we put our um, Facebook page link maybe in the chat? That would be great. Yes, thank you. That's awesome. Fantastic. Just had a question for Kati. Um, do you have any tips on how to connect or find other catchment groups close by? 
Yeah, so that's, I mean, I guess that's one of the problems really that there isn't a register as such where you can find other catchment groups. Um, I know that the New Zealand Land Care Trust has, um, is trying to, to map catchment groups around the country, but they're probably quite limited to just the New, that the New Zealand Land Care Trust knows. Um, the, the National Science Challenge Our Land and Water are looking into setting up a national register of land management actions. And as part of that register, we also want to um, connect catchment groups and show where catchment groups are. But for that, they obviously have to register themselves first. So not every catchment group likes to do that. So we're hoping that there's going to be a bit of a, a groundswell movement of catchment groups rising up and saying, hey, we're here and we're happy, happy to share. Awesome. Um, we've got one question for Caitlin um, about whether um, does that habitus and capital creating a candle mean that it might be easier or harder to communicate with children because they have a smaller candle? Oh, yeah, I think that, that was an interesting question um, when I saw it come in. Uh, and I would probably have to say that, um, no, it's just about acknowledging um, what those children are bringing with them. Um, they will have a candle. Uh, and I think um, you know, even from the time you're an infant, you're doing science. And so it's just helping. I think what, what actually happens is that lots of kids are bringing a lot with them. Um, it might not be branded specifically as science, especially sort of at a primary level where science is often getting integrated into other subjects and they might not realize that what they're doing is science. So it's helping them to, uh, wh whatever it is that, th that they bring with them, sort of acknowledging um, that and yeah, getting to see that there is science in that and that they have been doing science and are part of it. Mm. I think that's so important to encourage people to feel like they are a scientist from early days. It's not something that they have to aspire to become at some point. It's, it's there right, now. Right. Yeah, it sort of opens up what science is. And I think that, that the idea is that it, uh, by yeah, opening up um, what they already do and seeing the science in what they already do, they can then see science, it kind of works backwards to see science as more than just being a job that maybe works in a lab or does scientific research. There's bits of science in all different types of careers. Absolutely. Well, thank you all so much. Um, there's been some really, really great comments as well, um, as well as questions. Some people are very impressed with this, the way that all of you are doing such self-motivated work where you're, you're recognizing such a, a, a niche and such a, um, for, for in so many different areas of science and filling that so wonderfully. So um, we'll share the chat as well um, so that you can see those, but hopefully you've seen those comments it, coming in. Um, so, um, just I wanted to thank all of our wonderful speakers for their really inspiring talks today um, and to all of you for attending. I hope that you've enjoyed it as much as we have um, and that you'll join us again tomorrow at half past 12 where our talks will be centered around participatory and community science programs. I also wanted to say that Toby Morris from the spin-off is going to be joining us on our Friday session for the panel about drawing science. So we're looking, really looking forward to that. Um, Thanks for joining. Enjoy the rest of your day. Matiwa.